Uh, it's my honor to introduce Jan, um, who's one of our great partners from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we've done a number of stream and habitat restoration projects um, in partnership with Jan, and the most recent one was a really interesting stream restoration project at our Van Riper Conservation Area, and I'm sure he'll probably touch on that project during the um, during the event tonight. So. Uh, without further ado, I turn it over to you. Um, good evening, everyone. Assuming you can hear me, Kelly. Thumbs up. Yeah, yeah you sound great. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, as I was telling Kelly before you all joined, I am um, through no one's fault but my own. I, I managed to end up being in West Virginia for this presentation. So, so thankfully it was a Zoom meeting, not an in-person meeting. So we're still able to go ahead. And, um, but so my name is Jan Didici. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I work in our Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. Um, and through the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, we do habitat restoration on private lands, municipal lands, um, you know, some work on state land um, throughout the country. Um, the New York field office where I work um, is you know, focused on New York, New York State. And we have several priority areas within the state. And one of those priority areas is the Finger Lakes region. And so we've been, you know, active with with lots of um, groups, municipalities, um, nonprofits in in the Finger Lakes region, doing restoration work, um, encouraging best management practices, and um, and those types of behaviors. So we've done, as Kelly mentioned, several projects with the Finger Lakes Land Trust over the years. Um, a lot of wetland projects. Um, recently completed a stream restoration project, and. Um, and talking to Andy Zepp, um, you know, he had, he had asked if I could do a presentation on, on stream restoration and, you know, kind of its importance and, and why we do it. And so, so that's kind of the focus on this talk. And um, <clears throat> I'd wanted to talk about fluvial geomorphology and kind of go into, you know, what is ge geomorphology, and fluvial geomorphology. But, you know, this is kind of a, it could be a full you know, bachelor's degree or master's degree, or probably even a PhD. Um, so, you know, it's obviously more than we can um, handle in, in 35, 40 minutes here this evening, but um, I'm just going to kind of touch on <clears throat> kind of the big, big picture for a bit. And this is probably the most complicated slide I'll show you tonight, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how we look at, at streams and, and, um, and watersheds. And we basically start at the bottom of that pyramid and, and work our way up. Um, with hydrology, you know, the water that's that's falling out of the sky is snow or rain, um, you know, or in, any kind of precipitation. Um, the hydrology that hits that landscape, how it moves through the, the landscape, either through infiltration into the ground. Um, then the hydraulics, when that water hits a stream, you know, how it acts in the stream. Um, up to the geomorphology, so we're you know, moving up this hierarchy. Um, and in that stream, how sediments moved and trees are moved and, you know, that material in the move and how that Creates diverse bed forms, diverse habitat types, um, you know, within that stream system, and you know, in this dynamic equilibrium that I'll touch on again here in a little bit, and then up to the kind of the physiochemical interactions in the stream, how temperature and oxygen are regulated, you know, riparian cover and shade, and then you know, Fish and Wildlife Service. Our concern, obviously, is the biology at the top. Um, but realizing that you can't really do anything in a stream without understanding, you know, everything that comes below. So, you know, everything starts with that hydrology. And just um, another way to illustrate it maybe is just, you know, in this, this typical cross section of a, of a valley, um, you know, water, it, it rains on this landscape, a lot of water infiltrates into the ground. You have those wetlands on, on the side. Um, I think this pointer, so, you know, you have wetlands on the side of the channel. That, that trap water, hold water. Um, water that does go into the channel, then that becomes the hydraulics. Um, as you have wood and um, falling into the into the into this channel, that affects that geomorphology, the shape of the channel. And um, and then the chemistry again, you know, if you have shade or you know different different geological zones, you know, you might have a very calcareous soil. So you have, you know, high pH um, water or you know, acid soils, and you have you know acid water. Um, so, so there's different physiochemical and then how all of those things interact and affect the biology in the stream and then also in the riparian buffers around them. 
Um, so natural stream corridors, they're, you know, they're dynamic, they're stable, um, relatively stable. So, you know, this, this picture here is just a typical meandering stream with good connection to a floodplain. During a flood event, you know, when that water comes up, um, we call it stage, as that stage comes up in the, in the river, it goes out onto this floodplain, um, which dissipates a lot of that energy. So the velocities stay relatively slow in that actual stream channel. Um, material still moving in that stream channel. You know, there are pools and riffles and all that gravel in the stream that's moving. And in some storm events, you know, in flood events, you can you can shift, you know, a foot or more of, of bed material, but then it all redeposits you know, just based on the physics and the and the, and the, ge and the geometry of that stream and you know, the, the, the the width of the stream and the depth. All those all those physical characteristics of that stream channel. You know, affect how that material all redeposits out. So you can go out there at low flow and have you know riffles in a place, and then during that flood event, everything moves. Then it all redeposits back, and you go out after the storm, and everything um, looks like it hasn't moved. And we know this because we can put scour chains in. I um, mean, you know, we just bury chains down into the gravel, and they're they're vertical. And then after the storm, they you know we come back out and find them, and, and oftentimes they're just laying down flat, which means everything's moved and they've tipped over and then filled back up to where they were. So. So they're dynamic, but they're in this equilibrium where they kind of resort back to this stable condition. And um, so this next picture is just another stable stream. It's just a different type of stream, right? It's not that, that low gradient meandering stream. It's more, I, it's a steeper gradient. You, you don't really have distinct floodplains. It's more flood prone area. And this is important because when you're trying to restore streams, you want to make sure that you know what type of stream you're working in. So we have this, um, stream classification system. We use this um, natural channel design stream rest um, classification system designed by um, Dave Rosgen, who's a hydrologist from Colorado. And, um, and, and this just gives us a way to, to kind of quantify what, what stream type we're working in, what the stream type is. So, you know, when, when we work with colleagues and partners, we know what type of stream we're trying to restore. And um, I'll just point out, because the next slide, um, this will be somewhat important, is that these stream types here at the end, the F and the G channels tend to be unstable. So if you're in, a, if you're in one of these conditions, um, you're unstable. And unfortunately, a lot of our streams in, in New York as a whole, and you know, many of them in the Finger Lakes are in this condition. They're not, a, they're not stable. They're not in that dynamic equilibrium. Every storm event, there's you know, mass wasting of banks. And, um, but these are all the, the stable conditions, except maybe for, for D, this D and, and DA. But um, so <clears throat> uh -oh, my slide stopped advancing. Do you still hear me? Do you yeah, still hear me, Kelly? I can hear you. Yeah, I just got a message that PowerPoint has stopped responding. Huh. Um, this will be tough without slides. I mean, I can keep talking, but um, while you're while you're um, redoing your PowerPoint, why why is it that those the two stream types that are the most common in our area are the most unstable? Like, are there what are the characteristics that make them so unstable? Um, well, so a lot of it is. Um, sorry, I'm not a very good multitasker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, and and I'll get into this um, a little bit here, but. Um, sorry, just, uh, I apologize, everyone. I think at this point in our um, in careers, we've all had PowerPoint problems. I just don't know, I don't know why that happened, but, um, anyway, are we back? Yep. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, I, I think I'll get to your question in a little bit, um, so we have this, this transition. So, um, you know, I was talking about kind of this classification system we use where, um, you know, these, these, um, these channels over here are the stable form. Yeah, you can't see my point. So these are the stable form over here. You know, this A, B, and C, and these, and E, and, and this F and G are, are, tend to be unstable. And so we, um, man, it froze up again. Is it the pointer that's doing it to me? Um, so, so we have these um, channel evolution models where um, you know it's just a way to to kind of classify how 
Um, Doug. It, maybe it is the pointer. I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do it without it. Um, anyway, so so we can. Um, So, so with those stream types, as as, um, as as things happen, disturbances, um, perturbations happen, you know, on the landscape, it can affect those stream types and move them from those stable conditions to those unstable conditions. So, whether it's uh, you know a response to a flood, when we have a big flood, there's often a big um, amount of sediment that that moves into the system. Um, our our you know, the town's reaction or the municipalities, the government action tends to be to get in there with, with bulldozers and excavators and, and clear, clear the stream back out, fix the stream. And um, often that can lead to um, unstable conditions that then kind of just escalate and, and snowball and, and make things worse. And, um, and so you, you get through this, you get into this transition of, um, of different stream types. So, you know, I talked about those stable stream types. So you can go from these stable stream types to unstable stream types. And then as um, um, <clears throat> as if, if, if you if you give it enough time, it'll eventually revert back to a stable stream type. Um, unfortunately, with you know, since we're living in in, in a highly populated area with I mean, I guess we're not a highly populated area, but, uh, you know, we have infrastructure, we have, we have things, we, we're not willing often to just let the stream adjust on its own and take that, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years that it might take for it to adjust and, and return back to that stable form. So we, um, so we take the approach of trying to go back in and, and set the stream to one of those um, stable forms. And I'm gonna try to share one more time. And I really appreciate everyone's patience. And um, looks good. Okay, well, I won't use the pointer again. Okay. Why does it? Why does any of this matter? So you know, back in this is a picture that I got from New York State Archives. You know, back in 1960, and you know, we had stable streams back then. We have stable streams now. Um, I just brought this historical picture in because. You know, a lot of the reason that a lot of our streams are in the condition they're in, and this is getting to your question, Kelly, is that we have, we have had a history of, of managing streams, right? So historically, you know, streams were ways to get logs from the mountains um, down, down river. So, you know, up in the Adirondacks, they would pile these logs up in these big, um, big stack piles, and then they would come in in the spring when the water is flowing and knock those bottom logs out and roll all those logs down into the river. You know, just for a sense of scale, you can see these, you know, these log walkers out here. Um, you know, just so just masses of, of amounts of material was transported down these river channels. And in order to facilitate that, they went in there with big steam shovels or hands and ox and just you know, took boulders out, took all these features out, all these roughness features that, that slowed water down and um, you know, when you tried to have a log drive, they also slowed those logs down. So they removed all these features and just made these big water conveyance channels to move that water through. And so when you when you do that, you change the that you know that the that you know equilibrium within the stream and it starts these unstable conditions. And, and a lot of these streams are still adjusting now, you know, hundred years later, they're still adjusting to those disturbances. And then oftentimes, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, after flood events, you know, we go in and, and try to fix that stream, manage those streams after those flood events, that just kind of resets the clock. And, um, and, and then it's, it's back on again. So, you know, it wasn't only logging. Um, this is, there's a, a neat, um, you, the, again, the, the state has a, has a cool, um, the, the state library in Albany has, has, you can go back and look at all these old records, of, of this engineering record. So I just pulled this up. Um, a while ago. So Canisarega Creek, this is out, um, you know, the 390 corridor that goes up, um, up to Rochester, you know, basically south of Rochester. And you can see, can, can you see my pointer, Kelly, or you can nod or, yeah, okay. So, so you can see how the stream used to meander and then, um, you know, and it used to have all this debris in it and they call it debris, all this wood and, and other features. And so to, to 
reduce flooding in these fields, you know, which are reliant on water and that redeposition of sediments and all those natural processes that happen with, with you know, periodic flooding, to reduce flooding in, in, in all the crop fields, they went in and straightened it. And you see that new straight line and um, you know, going through there and then cleared it and obviously improved the channel to carry off that high water. And in doing so, you know, kind of set off this perpetual cycle of, of instability. And just another interesting fact is a lot of the town lines out here follow this old meander pattern, even though those meander patterns go through fields now because the stream is still straight. But, um, so, you know, we carried that behavior on into the 50s and 60s. And this is just, you know, an aerial photo from you know, the Cornell lab somewhere in, in Shenango County or Tompkins County. I don't remember where, but it, you could basically find anywhere in the state and find this. You know, just straighten that stream. You can see the old meander patterns in here and just straighten it. And that just, you know, creates an unstable system. It creates a lot of bed load. It, you know, destroys the habitat in the stream. And here's just the close, you know, we're still doing this, right? This is a few years ago out in Western New York, um, a trip to the Genesee River. And, um, and you know, our response to floods is go in, berm it up. And, you know, it might, it works until the next time it floods, um, but it, you know, completely destroys the stream habitat. There's no real biological function in there. Um, it's just, it's, it's really not a, an appropriate response to flooding in, in our mind, because it doesn't stop flooding. It doesn't reduce flooding. It just, the perception is that it does, but, but the reality is that it doesn't. Um, you know, every once in a while, we'll have a municipality put in a low flow channel. So this was supposed to be, this was this municipality's attempt to put in a low flow channel for fish. This is a trout stream. Um, but you know this this isn't a good condition. Um, so and then you know our response has been to you come in and you rip wrap a bank and that'll protect it. But then the river has other ideas, so it takes it out. So you put in bigger stone, and um, and you know the river has other ideas and takes the stone out. This this is actually Six Mile Creek. Um, it flows down into Hugo Lake and. Um, and every once in a while, the engineers get it right. And they, you know, they might create a stable channel, but you know, I would argue that this is this is just a, a water conveyance canal. It's not an active stream. There's no real riparian buffer. There's no you know in-stream habitat diversity. It's just a trapezoidal channel that transports water. Um, <clears throat> so back back to this picture, just to show. So it, so in a kind of a natural system, you, know, you still have houses in development. In a natural system, when it rains, you you know water comes down. Um, you get this rainfall event. So this, these bars on the left side of this graph kind of represent that, um, that rainfall over you know, a relatively short period of time. This red line um, is a re representation of flow. Um, you know, we, we measure water moving through streams as, as flow, cubic feet per second, typically, um, and over time. So you get a big rain event. It, you know, a lot of it infiltrates, some goes up in evapotranspiration in the summertime, but a lot of it ends up eventually in the channel and you get this surge, you get this peak and you get this, you know, this is kind of the peak flood event and it's extended over a relatively long period of time and then, and then tapers off. Um, so we go in and we put all this impervious surface in the landscape, we, you know, we channelize streams, we, um, we dig ditches, we do, we do a lot of activities either directly or indirectly to get water off the landscape into those river channels quicker. Um, so what that does is you have the same amount of rainfall and now, you know, it's the same volume of water. You know, the area under this curve is, is that volume of water that's come down as rain. But instead of being a, you know, a slow rise to a, a rel relatively low level, you know, and spread out over a longer period of time, you get this rapid spike. So you get this big peak of, of water, you end up with a, you know, a flood that's a lot bigger in magnitude, you know, just, just you know, maybe 30% bigger. And again, these are just hypothetical numbers, but, but these data bear out. And um, so, so because of our um, activities on, on, in the watershed on that landscape, you know, we, we, we can affect the hydrology, that water that's going into the channel directly. And, um, and that has consequences for, for this, channel evolution, right? So you start off with a stable channel. Now you're, you know, you, there's, there's some perturbation on the landscape and that, um, and, you know, now you get that big slug of water, it can incise it down to, to a, this G channel. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about this. So, so as that stream cuts down, 
um, you know, now it's conveying all that water and sediment. And then, then the stream wants to naturally start to meander again. So it starts going back and forth in, in this narrow channel, making a wider channel. And in doing so, it takes all this bank material and, and brings it downstream. So from a water quality perspective, we're now bring, you know, mobilizing a lot of this bed load. Um, you know, a lot of the bed load that we have, um, you know, in the Finger Lakes is glacial till, there's a lot of cl clustering clays in there. So a lot of those clays and, and fine materials get mobilized and end up, you know, in, in the lakes, in our drinking water reservoirs, um, you know, and just um, decreasing water quality. Um, <clears throat> and so, so kind of a, a, a graphic example of this, this was, um, this was on Cuga Inlet. And um, we were doing some work up here and I noticed, so th these log structures in here that you can sort of make out on these pictures, these were old cribbing structures that the Conservation Corps put in probably in the 1960s or 70s for fish habitat. And when they put them in, the stream bed was up, you know, probably where my cursor is. Um, so up, you know, halfway down that, that waterfall was a stream, but these were all underwater. These were providing habitat for fish. The, the bed of Cuga Inlet has since dropped, you know, five or six feet in spots, you know, due to activities that have caused that incision. And this, this old cribbing is acting as a, as a check dam for, the, for all that material upstream. So all that, that stream upstream that's flowing down over that um, is being held in place by just that old cribbing. And I thought at some point it would give, and, and it did, unfortunately. And, um, and so what happened is that everything upstream, so where you used to have that stream channel up here on top of this surface, um, you know, is that, that, that C channel all the way to the left of that channel evolution model where you had good connection with a floodplain has now cut down through, it's incising, banging around in there, bringing all that sediment down into Cuga Inlet that then goes off into Cuga Lake. And, um, and this, this head cut worked up this, this little tributary for hundreds of feet until it hit a big clay lens. And, you know, then it started, that clay is pretty cohesive, it sticks together well. So, you know, it didn't really erode through that, but it's still, you know, but all this material went downstream. It's completely avoidable. You know, we could have gone in there and, and armored that or, 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 um, or done something to, to protect that, to maintain that grade. So, so streams have a, <clears throat> have a tendency to cut down the lowest level in the landscape. And this is kind of a, a geological phenomenon, right? It's, you know, we have these Holocene terraces that are that are high elevation, and, you know, over the millennia, the rivers have cut down and they, they keep cutting down. And, um, and, and again, it's a natural process. And, um, you know, these things can become stable over time. Um, but in, in a lot of instances, we don't, we can't just let them get unstable. There's infrastructure, there's, you know, all this um, sediment loading. But streams and, and water channels have have this tendency to, to cut, and um, and so that, you know, again, that's what happens in this channel evolution model. You start on top, it cuts down, and as it's doing so, it, it brings all that material out. And that not only happens in um, in natural systems, but it also happens in our, our roadside ditches. So, um, you know, so this picture on the left, this is a county road, um, you know, just down the road from my house. I live in in the town of Dryden. Um, this is a Tompkins County road and they came in and they, they hogged out this ditch for whatever reason, you know, it was a, a well vegetated ditch. They decided it needed to be deeper. So they dug it out and you can see how, how much it cut down. So it's a relatively steep slope stream. So those same processes happen in these ditches. It cuts down and then that head cut works up the valley and all that material ends up going downstream. Um, so, so they didn't really accomplish what they, what they were set out to accomplish. Um, you know, they spent money going in there and digging it out, and then they spend money to come in and put riprap in it all to, um, you know, and that might that might stabilize it, but now it just takes that water, you know, down down that valley even quicker. There's less infiltration, you know, all that water just shoots down this thing, and so you end up with those higher graphs down at the end. Um, <clears throat> so, so our approach is to use, um, you know, that that channel the stream classification system, try to mimic those natural reference conditions and, um, and create a, a stream that has a stable um, dimension, that's you know, the, the channel dimension, a pattern and a profile um, that you know, can transport that sediment, um, can, can provide those, those basic functions. Um, and you know, all, these, all these things depend on the, the geological setting. If you have a wide valley like this, this is a, a project we did with the Nature Conservancy um, 
Honeyoy Inlet. Um, it's over on the south side of Honeyoy Lake. And the stream used to just come along um, this hedgerow on the east side of the valley. And, and we, we kind of re-meandered it through the valley, reconnected floodplains, created some, some ancillary you know, wetland habitat. And this is a year after um, the restoration. So, so what we try to do is, is take these, these natural, these low gradient systems or these higher gradient systems and mimic you know, so we, we go out, we measure the, the stable reference condition, and we try to mimic that in our restoration. So, so what do you do? So you're, you're a landowner, this is your backyard, you know, it's eroding. Um, you know, you, you can't obviously go out there and, and fix it yourself. You need, you need help. Um, you know, the, probably the first source of help is your local soil and water conservation district. Every, every county in the state has a soil and water conservation district. Um, and you know they're they're kind of a first point of contact for providing some some level of technical assistance, and you know they might be able to find funding for a project depending on the project and, and where it's situated. Um, they're they're you know NGOs um, that that might be able to help, but probably the first place to to go is call. So this is a project in Ontario County. So the landowner here called the the district. The district called us, and you know so we were able to go out there. Um, using those that classification, you know, so we basically built a channel with a you know s stable um, bed form that protected that toe. So this is that same bank, you know, a couple of years later, with you know now a stable floodplain down on inside. So this upper surface is the terrace, and um, you know we so we can't come to the rescue in, in every case, but um, the, you know there are opportunities in high priority systems where where we can. Um, this is the Van Riper Preserve that, that Kelly talked about. So um, there's deep gully erosion here. Some of these gullies were taller than I am, and you don't know how tall I am because I'm sitting in a chair in West Virginia. But you know, I'm six three, and I, I could stand in the bottom of these things and look up, and you know. And so all these clays and fine materials and some of the gravel, you know, every every rain event just more and more erosion. So um, so this is you know in that channel evolution model this is down in that that G is that that gorge that's unstable is going to continue to to move laterally expand and um, and and bring all that sediment down to the lake so so land trust approached us um, looking for a different approach you know kind of a different way to stabilize it rather than just going in there and on the the traditional engineered approach is to just go in and, and dump all that rock in there and kind of stabilize it that way just hard armor it. And, and hope it all stays. So, so just um, well, about a month ago now, um, you know, the contractor finished. So we went from I mean, this deeply incised, unconnected stream channel. And this is a small stream channel. It's only you know four or five feet across. It's a, it's a pretty small drainage. But we brought it up. We reconnected it to a flood prone area. Um, you know, we used a lot of logs and wood. These kind of step pool structures just to get that stream down the valley. You know, without cutting down too far because these these logs will act as grade control and um and, and so we can get that water down and dissipate out you know infiltrate through the soils and um this is a finger lakes land trust crew out there you know, doing some planting last week i think so um was it two weeks ago now losing <laughs> track of time sorry um just another example this is um country club and in, in skinny atlas um you know they had uh, at the time, Nature Conservancy had a had a watershed coordinator who was who was doing a lot of this um, and reach out to folks and um, they approached the country club and um, they were interested in doing a project. So, um, you know, we we worked with the Nature Conservancy to, to develop a design. Um, the um, Skinny Atlas Lake Association, um, you know, invested a, a fair chunk of money in this, um, you know, for and um, and so we ended up with with a, a stable channel you know those eroding banks aren't eroding anymore so we went from this f stream type um you know super wide down below it's still still adjusting itself down here trying to find a stable pattern um, but without any real stability on these banks because it's you know it's a golf course they mow right up to the edge um you know it, it keeps eroding kept adjusting you know indefinitely um we just brought the grade up a little bit spread those banks out a little bit you know, created a, a stable channel condition based on, um, you know, those those reference conditions, those those natural stream conditions, and now we have a you know relatively stable stream that isn't just a rock lined water conveyance. Now, you know, they're fishing here. These little pools below these these log structures, 
um, hold fish. Um, you know, this, this material up here is just leaf litter. This, this is a picture that um, Frank Moses, I think, took. He shared it with me. I'm assuming he took it. Um, and, um, you know, this is the leaf litter just from the runoff this spring. So water was up, um, you know, up at this higher elevation. And, and as far as I know, there, there haven't been any um, major problems. You know, it's stable. It's, it's not eroding. Um, we basically cut the sediment supply from these banks, at least, you know, down to, to nothing into the, into the lake. Which was our objective, and um, just just one more project, on, and I only included this because this was this is a project out on um, Reynolds Gully, which is a trip to Hemlock Lake, and I included it because the Finger Lakes Land Trust acquired um, a conservation easement just downstream of here. Um, I think they they closed on it, you know, a, a month or two ago, you know, this year sometime they closed on it. And so this was a dam that, so the Nature Conservancy, again, you know, we worked with Nature Conservancy on this, they own this property, they had this dam on it, and um, they wanted to, to sell the property to the state. You know, now it's the, um, the Harriet Tubman State Park, I think. Um, so they, they wanted to sell it to the state, but the state wouldn't buy it with the, with the dam on it. So um, Nature Conservancy approached us, we agreed to help them decommission the dam. We took the dam out. Um, this is a brook trout stream. DEC came out there and surveyed brook trout. Um, you know, we took that dam out and, and replaced it with this um, kind of step pool system going up 10% grade. So this is trying to mimic that, that higher gradient stream that I told you, that I showed you before with all those big boulders and rock that had all the roughness that slowed that water down. And, you know, fish can get up through here. We, we've, marked fish downstream of the dam before we did the project. And then they, the EC went out and surveyed and they caught some of those marked fish upstream. So fish can clearly make it up through there. And, um, and, so, and so this is how we, you know, we get that fish in that water. And so one of the advantages of doing this, so often a, a technique in taking dams out is just take the dam out, stabilize the stream, and but then you have all the sediment in that impoundment. And you can either come in and dredge all that sediment out at great cost, or just hold it in place with these, these structures and so all that you know this now you have a, a stable stream type down through here all that sediment stays upstream there's no cost to remove it so you can do something like this at a, at a much lower cost than if you had to go in and dredge that whole impoundment down and this is just a view a little bit further upstream um so that's that's about it um i know andy had asked me about 35 minutes 40 minutes so I maybe went a little fast but um, I think the goal here was really just to, um, to kind of give you a very brief overview on, on stream function and, um, you know, some, some restoration, some, some pictures, and, and maybe, um, you know, certainly we're going to spend a good, good amount of time here, hopefully answering questions and, and interacting. But, um, you know, feel free to email me or, or contact me if you have, you know, a project of, of your own um, that you'd like some technical assistance on or support on. Um, you know, again, we... You know, there's only two of us in our office who do this um, stream restoration work and we cover the whole state. And, you know, I, I mentioned we have priority areas and um, priority species and most of our work is focused around brook trout. Um, incidentally, this picture here is, um, is a project up on the West Branch of the El Sable River that um, my boss, Carl Schwartz, um, built a couple of years ago. And it's all, that was an eroding bank and all those logs that you can see sticking out of the bank. So we, we basically, this is, a wood structure and a, and a new bankful bench, that floodplain bench that we built in here. And then these rocks are kind of acting as gray control to keep that pool a pool. Um, but there's only two of us and we, we kind of, you know, are, are focused in our priority areas and our priority species, again, primarily brook trout. But, um, you know, if you need technical assistance, um, you can certainly reach out to us. Either of us, Carl can be reached at that same phone number. And, um, you know, we oftentimes we'll, we'll try to work with local entities, um, you know, depending on where you are and, and you know, what your needs are. Um, but, you know, it's rare we can just go in and, and do a, a project on, on anyone's property, but, you know, we can certainly provide assistance and direction. So with that, I guess, Kelly. Um, well, thank you so much, Jan. We have, we actually have quite a few questions. So um, I think I will start right pretty much from where you left off where you were providing your contact information and Carl Schwartz is, I don't know, people are probably writing that down right now. Uh, but are there any prerequisites, you know, or project specifications that that you require, that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service requires to get you to participate in a project? 
Um, well, not really. So, so the partners program is pretty, should I stop sharing this? You think everyone's had a chance to write it down? I think so. Um, so the, the Fish and Wildlife Service is, the, or the Partners Fish and Wildlife Program, we're basically a, a landowner driven um, program. The way it works is people call our office and, um, you know, we at least talk to the to landowners, see, see where they are, what their situation is, you know, where they live in the landscape, what they're looking to do. And, you know, if we can help, we'll, we'll go out and we'll do a site visit and, and we go from there. If we're not able to help, we'll, we'll maybe, you know, point them to, to other directions or to other resources. Um, you know, again, we're limited. There's only two of us in the office who do stream restoration, three of us total in our program. And, you know, we have to cover the whole state, but we do have priority areas. You know, we have big geographic areas, the Finger Lakes, the, um, the, the Great Lakes Plain, mostly up in the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, you know, the Adirondacks and um, you know, the Delaware Valley, some of the Delaware Basin and Upper Susquehanna drainage. So it's a pretty big areas, but um, but within those areas, we, we tend to be primarily focused on, on brook trout. Um, brook trout are you know, the only native trout in New York. Um, you know, there's concern with climate change and, and changing river conditions as, as temperatures get higher that you know, they're not gonna persist as, as, as well you know, without protecting the, the, those kind of core areas. So, so those are our, our real focus areas. Um, you know, in the Finger Lakes, we don't have many um, brook trout streams or streams that, that hold brook trout, but there are, there are several. Um, you know, Six Mile Creek, I mentioned earlier, um, the headwater Six Mile Creek is a pretty good population of brook trout. So, you know, that, that's kind of a, a local priority area. Um, there's some trips to the, um, the Shemung River um, over, um, I, I think DEC region, so DEC region eight, but further west from here. And, um, and then, but most, most of the, there aren't too many brook trout streams up in the in that northern part of the Finger Lakes region. But. Uh, and that kind of leads to right into the next question, which is, um, and I guess Six Mile Creek would maybe be one of them, but are there other tributaries in the Finger Lakes that were, that kind of need this more urgent attention or that you know, you know, have these places that could use some restoration? Well, so, you know, I think, I think just about every, every reach in New York is, is, is impaired at some level. Um, you know, Cayuga Inlet is a good example of a, of a stream that is, you know, actively eroding at, at very high rates in, in numerous spots. And, um, you know, we've, we've done work on Cayuga Inlet. So, so, you know, I said we're focused on brook trout, but we're also, you know, one of, one of our objectives is to, to get entities, um, you know, the state, hopefully, eventually, but to get municipalities to, to do the right thing and respond appropriately to incidents, you know, flooding incidents. So again, that, that reaction to a flood is to go in and, and dredge and, and do all these activities that end up having these, these adverse impacts. If we can work with municipalities to, to respond differently to those catastrophic events. And, um, you know, we, then, we'll, then we'll at least be starting in the right direction to, to maybe these longer term solutions. Um, but it can start with with small stuff, and so you know, just you know, in, in, I, I'm a resident. That I think I mentioned I, I live in the town of Dryden. So um, you know, on the Dryden Conservation Board, I'm, I'm on the Dryden Conservation Board. We try to work with our town DPW to influence how they manage ditches. Um, I, I'm sure many of you have heard um, Rebecca Snyder talk about um, roadside ditches and. You know how much water it basically shunts from that landscape. So the hydrology is that water hits the landscape and, and flows down the valley. You know, those those road ditch networks take up, upwards of twenty five percent in small watersheds of that water and shunt it directly into a stream. So you get this big influ influx of sediment and and nutrients that that affects water quality and, and all that sediment affects um, that geomorphology. You know within the channel and affects how the streams flow. So you end up with increased erosion. Um, so, so even though we're focused on, on brook trout primarily, you know, we're more than happy to provide technical assistance to, to anyone. So we work with Tompkins County Soil and Water on projects. You know, we work with obviously, you know, the Finger Lakes Land Trust, the Skinny Adams Lake Association. You know, I mentioned Nature Conservancy a couple of times. So we'll provide technical assistance on projects. We just won't necessarily be able to find funding for those projects or, um, you know, or, more more in-depth involvement. So, you know, our typical project, we go in, we, we survey, we design, 
we oversee construction and then, you know, so, so we take it all the way through. Um, but a lot of times we're just able to give technical assistance and, and go out and meet with landowners, meet with entities and tell them what, you know, a, a strategy that might work, that might work better for them. And, you know, a lot of the problem around Finger Lakes and around New York is just these, these unstable high gradient streams just dumping all this sediment and you know, nutrients to come with that sediment into the, into the lakes and the, or into bigger bodies of waters. Um, a few kind of uh, on the technical end, what, when you are adding those logs to create, you know, this, the stabilization, um, what happens when they rot away? Does, does that happen? Um, well, I haven't been around long enough for them to rot away. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so, so we, Van Riper is the, the first time we put it in a spot in an ephemeral stream. So normally we're putting them in, in perennial streams where there's water flowing year round. And submerged logs in, in that anaerobic condition you know, rot very slowly. And so, you know, we when when we're building projects, we pull wood out of the stream that's probably been there for you know hundreds of years. Mm. So the expectation is that water that's submerged constantly is, is going to last indefinitely. Um, a lot of the structures we use in, in stream restoration, we we use, you know, we use a lot of wood because. You know, I mentioned the logging earlier and our, our history has been to take wood out of the streams. And, and one of the things that's lacking in streams from a, from a fisheries perspective is wood, but that, that wood and stream also acts you know, as, as a roughness component that slows water down and um, you know, acts to, to reduce that flood stage because it's slowing water down, it's not passing it on down. So, so we add a lot of wood to streams, but we also use structures with, with law or rocks and, you know, um, not armored, but, but just just bigger structures. And um, but but what we're trying to do is is re reestablish kind of that framework within the system so that the natural processes can take over. So Van Riper, you know, if those trees rot in in fifteen or twenty years, you know, the hope is that the that the trees that you know that, that your crews planted or your volunteers planted on the banks, those those roots will then go in and you know take over and. Um, you know, that picture I showed of the cribbing that was acting as, as grade control. I had another picture that I actually took when I was out for a bike ride a couple of weeks ago on one of your um, easements and um, where there were just roots that were acting as a grade control on a ditch. So a ditch had been cut um, by my town, you know, over deep. And there, there were roots in a tree on a, on a side trip, just an ephemeral channel coming in that those roots were acting as that grade control. And when that channel gets under that grade control, you know, you're going to have four feet of cut, you know, going up that valley and all that material just coming in and um, filling in that ditch. They can come out and start that whole thing over again. So, um, so, so just, so, so we try to reset that stream and then the, the natural processes take over those trees grew, those roots, you know, act as that grade control. And, and you know, the, the intent is that it, it functions kind of normally after that or naturally. The slide that you showed with all of the different types of streams, is that mm -hmm. one that just the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uses, or does is that like kind of a commonly used? Um, it's, it's, so, so natural channel design is a very um, contentious um, methodology. So it was developed by, um, by a um, hydrologist, um, Dave Rosgen out in Colorado. Um, back, you know, he started working um, with Aldo Leopold um, back, or not Aldo Leopold, um, Luna Leopold, Aldo's son, um, <clears throat> on, on stream stuff back in the 70s. And you know, he's, he's developed this methodology and, um, and that, that classification table is something that, that he developed. And um, so some states in, in the, um, Maryland and Virginia and um, Kentucky and I see there are a lot of states that, that use that as part of their regulatory process. And, you know, they, they, they use that. New York is sort of on the on the border, um, or not on the border. On the, it, they haven't really come up with a, an official classification system, but we use it. Um, you know, all the all of our partners that, that we're working with, you know, in the Northeast, um, kind of use that same lingo. So if someone tells me they're working on a C four stream type, you know, I know it's a low gradient meandering stream with with gravel substrate. You know, a B2 is a, a steeper stream, you know, two to four percent slope with with big boulders in it. Um, so it's just a, it's just a, a way to easily classify and um, you know, but but no, it's not a it's not a 
necessarily a common thing. It's not, definitely not anything the Fish and Wildlife Service developed. It's just a way for us to be able to communicate and just design stuff. Yeah, great. You mentioned um, a few times fish returning, and there was a question about, is that happening? Or like, are the fish returning to these streams on their own, or is that or is uh, it, do they have a little help? So, so, I mean, a lot of what we do is, is fish passage work. Um, so, you know, that dam removal, you know, project that I talked about, there was, a, there was a, a dam there and there, there were brook trout upstream and there were brook trout downstream. And, you know, it was kind of a one-way trip for the brook trout. If they went down, they couldn't get back up. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of genetic, genetic work and, um, you know, that shows you can get these isolated populations that there isn't mixing or the ability to mix. So a lot of what we do is, is focus on replacing culverts and um, providing that fish patch, basically reconnecting all these um, minor tributaries so that, that those fish can move around. And, um, and so, yeah, so we, we don't typically do work in streams where there aren't any fish to start with. But usually there's a, there's a barrier of some sort in, the, in that stream. And I think I mentioned Skinny Atlas um, Lake that, you know, there were minnows in that stream, you know, probably um, black nose dace or something. And, um, you know, they, they were there before in, in the, you know, adverse conditions there, they, there's better conditions for them now. But if, if, you know, the traditional approach that, that I showed just that, you know, rocked, you know, water conveyance thing that, you know, there probably wouldn't be much surface water. Most of the water would probably inflate down through, it gets very hot in the summer and, you know, it just wouldn't be good habitat, so. Great, um, just, you know, in terms of things that people can do and, you know, for themselves, I have a question about, um, about rain gardens in front yards and creating some sort of like habitat buffer. Yeah, and that's, I mean, those are all great practices and I don't, you know, it, you know, it's death by a thousand, a thousand cuts, you know, in the, in the wrong way can also be, you know, a cure by a thousand stitches or something in the other. Right. So if, if we all put in rain guards, we all do our bit to you know, get a little bit less impervious on, on our piece. Um, you know, if just cumulatively, it adds up over time. Right. So, so you might not think that putting in a buffer or, or slowing that water from your property would make a big difference. But I think cumulatively, you know, if the 30 people um, on this call all did something, you know, and half of us happen to live in, in the same drainage, I think it'll add up to, to some benefit. So I think there's definitely a benefit to doing that. And, um, you know, the more we can do to get water to, to stay on the landscape and not just shunt it into streams and then down into the lakes um, will help. And kind of maybe not as directly as that, but just, you know, try to get involved with your, with your local town, you know, get on your planning board or get on your um, you know, town conservation board and figure out how you can direct, you know, a, a lot of our, a lot of our, our problems or maybe not problems, but there are a lot of issues that are that are coming up with how we manage and maintain our road network. And um, you know, it seems over the last ten or so years, but the highway departments have become a lot more aggressive in how they ditch and how they they try to get that water off the landscape. And um, you know, it's a it's a problem that that every you know we have so many towns and municipalities in New York that we we kind of have to tackle them all. You know, one piece at a time because the state DOT is just as bad as um, you know everyone else so they're probably leading the show in, in mismanagement of, of ditches and streams so um, you know we work with them on some projects but in, on other projects you know not so much so um, what you know as you think about how rainstorms are becoming more intense and you know this kind of historic effort to try to get the water off the land as fast as you can what are your kind of main concerns um, with this kind of increase in intense rain events? I think it's more it's it's how we respond to those events, right? So we we have big flooding events, and um, you know again, these these natural systems are very resilient, and, and if we were willing to let you know all, tons of material erode and move down through the system, eventually those systems would stabilize. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, the problem is, you know, we have houses, we have roads, we have all this infrastructure that, that needs to be protected, um, be protected. So, um, you know, if we can, <clears throat> when we do have a flood, because the next time we get, you know, five inches of rain in an hour, things are going to flood. Um, it's, it's how we respond to those floods that, that really reset that clock. 
Um, you know, when we go out after a flood and just dredge everything out, we create these, you know, we call them nick points in the stream. So you stop dredging at some place and you leave a three foot cut in the stream. And the next time it rains, that three foot cut works up that valley. And, it, you know, all that material down now gets mobilized and moves down. And, and as it deposits, you know, it doesn't go a long way down, but it, you know, deposits, typically it deposits in the middle of the channel. It causes the channel to go around to the sides and it causes more bank erosion. And every time it floods, you know, our, our same response is to go in and, and do the same thing and kind of reset that clock. And, um, you know, I mentioned the, the Ausable before, you know, we're, we're working on the East Branch of the Ausable and, um, you know, it's, it's been a hundred plus years since they were log drives on that river, but it's still, it's still fixing itself from that. And, you know, it's, it's well on its way. And then, you know, Hurricane Irene came through and kind of reset that clock or the response to Irene reset that clock. And, um, and so now, you know, we're, we're another hundred years away, but, you know, we're doing work there to try to accelerate that again. I'm using these natural processes and just trying to mimic what the stream is. And that's where those evolution models are, are useful because, um, you know, it, it shows what, what the, you know, where you are in that transition and what that stable form could be. So we try to build that stable form. We try to restore that stable form, get good floodplain connectivity and get all those features, you know, those geomorphic features in the stream to, to slow things down and provide that habitat, so. Um, I have a, a specific one. There's a somebody who has a road ford um, that goes across a tributary kind of near Skinny Atlas Lake. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering if there are steps that he can take to make it the vehicle crossing more friendly for habitat and aquatic life. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you can answer that without seeing it. But. Well, so, uh, you know, so, so oftentimes um, bridges or Ford, is it a Ford you drive through or I'm assuming it's a Ford you drive through. That's what it sounds like, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there isn't a lot you can do. I mean, you can span it with a bridge, you, know, you go up to a higher terrace. Um, you know, when you, when you put a bridge in, you wanna make sure that um, you, you're wider than the, so, you know, that, that, that flood width, that bankful width, the channel width, you know, where it gets out on that floodplain, um, you know, is a certain width based on, you know, all that geology stuff I mentioned before and, and you know, the watershed size. So, so say you had a 10 foot channel, you know, you want to make sure that your bridge is at least you know, 15 feet wide. So you have, you have a little bit of floodplain space under it and, you know, build it up at a higher elevation with good footers. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you have a Ford that you're just driving across occasionally, um, you know, we'll often put just a grade control structure in on the downstream side of it. So, so it doesn't head cut up and then it, um, you know, stays pretty stable and it'll be a little wider than, than it should be, but, but it'll be a relatively small reach, you know, within that bigger system that it shouldn't, it shouldn't cause too many problems. Just don't stop on it with a leaky oil pan. So one more technical question. Um, and that's kind of, as you're installing the logs, um, and you know, when you're doing the restoration work um, in some of the examples that you gave, is it, is the depth of the log determined by the grade or is there, what's the, how does that work with the, the log? Yeah, so, so everything's a function of the slope of the stream. And so we, we basically try to install them. So the, the top of the downstream log is higher than the bottom of the footer log. So we'll also we'll install these logs as pairs. There's a footer log, we call it you know, the lower one and an upper one. And so you want the downstream log to be higher than the bottom of the upstream footer log. So when it cuts down, it's not gonna cut down below. Cause we get these plunge pools, you know, as we come over these, these step logs, right? So they're relatively high gradient systems. And, you know, these high gradient streams dissipate energy by, by plunging vertically, right? So there's a lot of roughness features in those. And as they come over those logs, they, they scour out a pool. So we want that downstream top log to be higher than the upstream bottom log so that it doesn't scour down below that. If, it, if you put it lower, then it can scour down to a depth that's below those footer logs, and then they get exposed and potentially blow out. So, But yeah, it is a function of slope. So the, the flatter you get, you know, the further apart you can space them. Um, but also if you get too flat, you know, now you have another stream type. And that, that's where you go back to that you know, stream classification. Anything below 2%. Now, um, you know, now the stream wants to start meandering. And so when you try to get a stream to go straight in a low gradient system, you know, it just doesn't have the energy to move 
the sediment that's a part of the natural process through that system. So it starts to deposit and it starts to try to meander. And that's why, you know, those dredging projects through, um, you know, trying to straighten a meandering stream, you know, those low gradient streams is, is never going to work without constant, you know, maintenance because the stream wants to meander. I mean, it has to meander. It's the only way it can get down valley with all that material that's moving. You just can't do it in a straight line. You know, there's this relationship between slope and sinuosity and the more you know, sinuous the stream is, the, the flatter that valley. And as it gets steeper, it straightens out, so. Um, one quick definition. You you mentioned the um, term head cut. What right. is a head cut? So so head cut is um, is when you have a, a, a break in grade. So so if you have a stream that's coming down, you know, at, at a fairly uniform slope, um, then if you go out and dredge it and create now a, a kind of a nick point, so that that nick point there um, becomes a head cut, and as it as water comes rolling over that, it, it moves it up up that valley, so it ends up moving upstream. So, you, so that you know, if it's a two foot head cut at two feet of material, you know, by however wide your stream is, as that moves up up valley, all that material is now being transported downstream. And and as you lose grade, so that you know, if you remember the pictures with the cribbing, those fish structures that were you know five to six feet above stream bed now, you know that stream head cut down that six feet. So if you if you think of Cuga Inlet and how long it is, you know it's a mile plus long. So you have a mile times thirty five feet times six feet. You know, if you do the math, that's a lot of material that it ended up down in the lake. That now you know you're trying to figure out how to dredge it, and that's all preventable, right? If you put grade control in and you, and you stop it from cutting down from head cutting, um, you know you can stop all that, and then all those side trips that are contributing even more material. So um, so head cuts are kind of the you know that those big those big um, rocks that I showed that picture of. You know they were falling and they tried to stabilize the bank. Those those failed because they got undercut, um, and it wasn't necessarily a head cut. But there was a scour down there, but that that head cut can that losing that grade can be the same thing. So so almost all of our projects we have grade control. We try to maintain that stream bed so that it and and the, the function there is it, it puts it back out on that floodplain, lets the stream get out on the floodplain. Um, you know, there are situations where you don't have room, like you can't, you can't reconnect the floodplain because there's a house in the floodplain or there's a, you know, there's a store. Um, so, you know, that's, so then you, you work within an hour, you know, stream width, that belt width, and you, you try to meander a stream and put structures and roughness features in there that keep all that water um, in that system. But, so that's maybe a lot more complicated explanation to head cut, but. It's basically so the whole thing is complicated. <laughs> What's that? The, the whole thing is complicated. Lots of moving parts and you know different systems to think about. So thank you so much. This has been great, and um, I can tell from the just the number of questions that you know everybody's gotten a lot out of this. So we, we really appreciate your time. It was my pleasure. I'm glad I could could be here, and um, you know feel free if you have follow up questions to email me or call me and. Um, I'm, again, out of town this week, but I'll be able to be back next week. I'll respond next week. Great. And I'll put the um, land trust email in there, too. So anybody can email that info. And if you have questions that you think about later um, or, you know, at some point, this is recorded. So we'll share out the recording um, and, and then you can share it with friends who are interested in this, this kind of information. So thanks again. And we really appreciate your time and everybody else for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful night.